So welcome everyone. Manifesting. You got you got you got to do it. You got to do it. And if you don't take anything away, and if you don't take anything away today, how are you, Milka? I'm really well. How are you, Penny? I'm doing good. I'm so happy to be here at LMS Chat. Um, if you're in the wrong place, I mean, stick around or something. I don't know. Um, wrong place, yeah. right time. Wrong place, right time. Like, there's another, like, this is just a venue. This Zoom meeting is a venue. And people, <laughs> after this, they're going to be playing bingo. So stick around. <laughs> um, great. I Welcome to LMS Chat. Uh, we do this every last thursday usually so um we have had a bunch of amazing guests if you ever want to come through and hang with us that is when we will be here um should we just i i would like to just introduce my host and maybe that's a good place to start um because i have a great co-host with me um milka mered uh is from northern virginia she loves to dance um in quotations very average dancer some may say bad lol i'll be honest i think i haven't seen milka dance i feel like milka's probably okay um i think we should have milka get up and dance um <laughs> you can put in the chat if that's something you want to see if that's something you're interested in um her favorite movie as a kid was you got served playing into yes is oh, in the process of painting her bedroom which is wow what a task um how's that going is it going well um as you can see nothing has changed so it's going pretty okay um i'm in the process of deciding what colors i want to choose i like pink but pink might be a little bit too aggressive so i i yeah. feel like it might i feel like there maybe is a well i guess it depends what kind of pink like i feel like salmon might be nice yeah like i want like the, the warm light pink. right and like I have a whole bunch of paint cards, like just in my purse everywhere I go. Just I think cards. if your room was hot pink, I think you might go crazy. <laughs> I think that's the definition of going crazy. It's just living. <laughs> so thank you so much, Kenny, for that lovely introduction. Uh, maybe next time I'll, I'll dance during our commercial break. Um, but my lovely co-host, Kenny Carroll, he is a DC native. He took Latin in high school. And um, I'm really actually shocked by this statement. Um, he doesn't eat candy. I'm like, I love candy. And I just don't know how you go day to day. Like no mints, no peanut butter chocolate. No. Um, it, and it's funny. It, the, the short story, as a kid, I, I was just a weird kid. And I had some bad candy once. And in my head, I was just like, never again. Never again. It really and I scarred you that badly. It. it was, I don't know. I was dramatic. I, I had drama in me. So I was just like, it betrayed me once. Never again will I taste the, yeah, I don't know. Um, but it, I, I still eat a bunch of sweets. So it, it's just like, whatever. Um, yeah. But um, is there other stuff we should tell the audience maybe about LMS chat? Well, yeah, so for those of you um, who are joining us for the first time, this LMS chat, um, we do this monthly, like Kenny said, the last Thursday of each month. We've had um, a variety of poets come join us, very appreciative of all of that, and um, we want to make this as accessible as possible, so you should see transcripts um, live transcribing. Um, and you can adjust the settings um, for the sizing in your Zoom settings. Um, so just like a breakdown of uh, our uh, monthly session, you know, we go through um, poetry questions and we go through culture questions and then we finish off with a fun, my favorite section called Chop It Up. And these are all just ways in which we get to um, get more acquainted with our special guests. So you all are here for Jericho Brown, Dr. Jericho Brown, um, and he'll be reading um, for us, Dear Dr. Frankenstein, and we're super excited for him uh, to be joining us. So. Uh, I'll start off by reading uh, Dr. Jericho Brown's uh, um, bio. So Jericho Brown is the recipient of a um, Wedding Writers Award and fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Brown's first book, Please, in 2008, won the American Book Award. 
His second book published in 2014, The New Testament, won the Annisfield Wolf Book Award and was named one of the best of the year by Library Journal, Cold Front, and the Academy of American Poets. He is also the author of the collection, The Tradition 2019, which if you haven't got, go get it, which was a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award and the winner of the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. His poems have appeared in BuzzFeed, The Nation, The New York Times, The New Yorker, The New Republic, Time, and the Pushkar Prize Anthology, and several volumes of the Best American Poetry Anthologies. He's the Charles Howard Handler Professor of Creative Writing and the Director of the Creative Writing Program at Emory University in Atlanta. Shout out any Emory University family that's with us. Um, he's super cool. Go go read his stuff. Go do the things. Um, one of the best to do it. Um, matter of fact, he's one. Go find the famous people you like talking about him is, is who he is. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to bring to the virtual stage Jericho Brown. Oh, thank you. It's so nice. <laughs> it's very nice of you to say thank you. I think your sound went out, but maybe mine went out. No, I think, okay, yeah. No, we're good. Okay. So yeah, if you'd like, you can just start by reading and then we can get into these questions. Sure. And you all can um, access his poem on the link that I've just included in the, in the chat. Dear Dr. Frankenstein, I too know the science of building men out of fragments in little light where I'll be damned if lightning don't strike as I forget one may have a thief's thumb, another a murderer's arm and watch the men I've made leave like an idea I meant to write down, like a vehicle stuck in reverse, like the monster God came to know the moment Adam named animals and claimed Eve, turning from heaven to her as if she was his to run. No word he said could be tamed, no science, no design, nothing taken gently into his hand or your hand or mine, nothing we erect is our own. Give it up for Jericho Brown. <laughs> that was that was great. That was so great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, that was amazing. Thank you. Um and as we get our stuff back up here, again, thank you so much for being with us, Jericho. And um I know you're having allergy problems. So again, thank you. It means so much that you're here with us. Um, so maybe a great place to start is just, I don't know if this is a poem you read a lot or like are asked to read at a lot of shows, but how does it feel returning to it? It is a poem that people seem to like a lot. I, I used to read it uh, much more often than, than I do now. And not, not because of anything with the poem, really just because of time. And there are a lot of poems, that poem's a poem from my second book. And there are a lot of poems from my third book that I'm almost required to read. And so, and so if I read the ones that people want to hear from my third book, then there's only so much time for me to read. So I don't read it as much as I used to, but it was something that would come up when I would give readings. Um, what else did you ask me? That was, no, that was it. That was perfect. Uh, just like, how does it feel returning to it um, was the question, Sally. Um, there are things I love about it. There, I mean, I really uh, like the way that I return to a very direct rhyme at the end. I'm interested in um, in the sound. I'm always interested in the sounds of the poem and always pleased when I'm capable to sort of ride a wave of sounds that lead me toward meaning as opposed to starting the poem with some sense of meaning. Uh, that's because I don't, I'm not under the impression that I know what I want to say before I begin. Writing for me should be a process of figuring it out. When I was reading uh, tonight, what I really liked is how the poem sort of begins to open and turn. I mean, the first part of the poem seems to me a personal problem. Um, I too know the science of building men out of fragments in little light. Uh, but then it turns toward a, a, a um, what must have always been the problem, sort of pointing to it as not particularly personal uh, toward uh, the middle where I say, like the monster, which given our title, you would think, uh, I love this line break. I think I did good there, good job. You would think I was about to talk about Frankenstein's monster, but then that turns. And I, I was actually surprised by that when I was reading it just now, 
it makes me feel, I mean, which is what you want when you read your poems, when you're working on your poems, you want to feel a sense of surprise, like, oh, did I mean that? Oh, did I say that? Oh, wow. Even though it came out of you, you still want to be surprised by it. Uh, because if you're not surprised, then a reader won't be surprised. So like a vehicle stuck in reverse, like the monster, God came to know the moment Adam claimed and anim named animals and claimed Eve. And so then the poem, which um, maybe was, uh, I really hate speaking this way because I don't believe it, but I'm, I'm lacking words right now. But as a way that the poem starts uh, narrow and then becomes completely wide, it's not just about um, the speakers or my relationship problems. It's about the first relationship and what has uh, transpired in relationships since that first relationship um, in an archetypal way, in a mythological way, sort of trying to look at that rate relationship to see what the speaker has done wrong or to see how the speaker has been done wrong, maybe. Yeah. One of the first things that me and Milka kind of like, I, it's always fun getting a, a great poem like this because we just like talk about like, not only how much we love it, but also like the meaning of it and if this was intentional. So one of the first things that I kind of saw and me and Milka talked about was like, it feels like in the poem, there's this parallel between the speaker, Dr. Frankenstein and God. And I always, when I was reading it, I thought that was really interesting just because like, these are characters that maybe I don't imagine meeting all at once, just from what I know about the speaker, what I know about Dr. Frankenstein and God. So I was curious how you brought all those characters into the same poem. Um, I think I understood going in that Frankenstein's problem was that he had a God complex. Mm -hmm. uh, and another one of his problems is being a control freak, right? And I think part of what I'm trying to, um, what I'm thinking about, you know, when I, I, it's hard to speak about it this way because obviously the poem is you at the same time that it is not me, but there are things that I want to figure out um, from my own life as I'm writing poems. There are things I want to heal. There are things I want to understand better about my present day and my past or about how I'm going to handle the future. And so uh, I know that I can be a control freak um, and so then I started thinking, well, who are the control freaks? You know what I mean? Who gets uh, all the control? And I think that's how God ended up in the poem. And I think that's how Adam ends up in the poem. Um, generally, when I'm working on a poem, there's like this uh, another eye inside of my brain looking at the poem for opportunities to expand. And I'm not just talking about metaphor. Obviously, I'm always looking for opportunities to make metaphor. Um, because, because that makes us know a thing, metaphor makes us know a thing better, which is why every metaphor is two parts, tenor and vehicle. I mean, that vehicle part of the metaphor literally. Sorry, I accidentally clicked the button, go ahead. It's like something that we did not, that we did not know, right? So when you say, for instance, the linebacker was a bear, uh, then what you end up doing is you're using a bear to better understand the linebacker. The linebacker is the tenor. The bear, the bear obviously, is the vehicle. So that um, that's one of the things that I'm doing. But I'm also thinking about linebacker, in this case, Frankenstein, in this case, self, in this case, God, in this case, Adam. How do I make that happen on a bigger level? Like, what is a linebacker archetypally? What is a, a linebacker mythologically? Um, is a linebacker Achilles, somebody who went into war to fight battle, battles. Do you see what I mean? And if I can make certain kinds of links like that, then I, I can expand the basis of the poem such that when the reader reads it, when I read it, when I'm working on it, I can feel that the poem is um, reaching beyond itself into that which even I did not expect. And that's what you, I mean, well, that's what I really want from my poems. I want them to feel it wants poems need to be like immovable, unchangeable artifacts. Do you know what I mean? Like it wants a poem needs to be like a painting. You know what I mean? Or a song. Like once, a, I mean, you know, now we live in remix land, but there it used to be. <laughs> but you only heard one version of the song. Do you know what I mean? Like there's, no, there's no remix to Whitney Houston's I Have Nothing. And when you hear I Have Nothing, it, Somehow or another, it wears you out, but wears me out every time I hear it. And yet, 
if, I mean, particularly because when she gets the fermata, she's like out of breath, right? And yet she strains through she strains through the note, which is fascinating to me because they they kept it on the record. You know what I mean? Like they didn't go back and re-record it. She had never made a sound like that before in her career. I mean, it was really. I mean, I will always love you is sort of like the example of Whitney Houston's like hide a voice. Then I have nothing is also the example of that voice sort of making a kind of a, a decline. Um, what was I talking about? Oh yeah. So part of part of what I want to do is I want to make the fixed thing, but in order to make the fixed thing really work, it has to be like the living thing. You have to feel that it changes. You have to feel that it moves. And that only happens if the poem can reach beyond what even you expect of the poem. Um, so I think poems are really better. Uh, I think poems are really better related to uh, trees. You know, tree, you know, if you plant a tree, it's not going anywhere. So it's kind of like a fixed thing. But depending on the season, depending on the weather, but you, you understand that it's a real thing. The other thing that's interesting to me about trees is uh, everybody has one. Like everyone, um, every when I say everyone has a tree, everybody immediately thinks thinking starts thinking of their own tree. It's amazing. It's, and I mean, sometimes it's not even a tree that was in your yard or that you own, right? Like, but there's a tree in your life. And that's what a poem needs to be like. People need to be able to read it and feel like that's my poem, you know, or those are my poems, hopefully. It's it's funny hearing you talk, um, and then Milka, you can go. Because I'm just, again, just as a fan who's like pulling things out, it almost the way you're describing a poem for you as something that is both, you know, almost like dead or alive or not in the way that like a thing is dead but in the way that a thing is still and can be observed almost feels to me like the way a frankenstein's monster is you know both a dead or alive thing which is something i wasn't thinking about in the poem because i kind of read it as a relationship but do you think in a way like your poems are you know things kind of like you're saying that like you are the god of where it's like you're so critical of and it's also something maybe like that leaves your control even yeah I think, well i'll say this about this poem um well maybe first i'll say this about frankenstein you know his problem is that he wanted to build a human but he was trying to build a fixed thing and humans are not fixed we are not artifact life you can't there's no telling what we might do do you know what I mean? And there was no telling what Frankenstein's monster might do, right? And uh, I think, and I was gonna say this later, but I guess it's coming up now, I guess this is later. I think what's interesting to me seeing the poem again, I mean, I, I used to think this more consciously and I hadn't thought about it in a while, but looking at it now, I see that all the more clearly. The poem is in many ways an ars poetica, right? The poem is a poem to the self about the process of making, about mm -hmm. making a poem. And how um, if you do well, I mean, one sign of writing the poem that is the poem you really want to make is that you lose control over it. Like you can't plan where you're going to see it again. You can't tell it what to do. It's over and it doesn't belong to you anymore. I mean, this poem, I mean, it's my poem. I wrote it, but in it, there's a way that it's more yours, Kenneth, and more yours, Milka, than it's mine, you know, now that I have put it out in the world. That, I, it's funny as a poet, and it's funny, I think Nicole Tong in the chat is on the same page as me. Milka, ask her question before I just- No, 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 please. I just like, I, you just got me so excited like looking at your reaction. Cause, cause it's just, yeah, I think that's a beautiful thing to, or the beautiful thing about poetry is that it can be something that like, you know, now, like you created it, but now it's like something. And I think you described this in our interview once as like poems like each person has their own poem the same way kind of like you're saying they have a tree but it's something that like even for people who like don't like poems they have a poem that they live by and they have a poem that they like work with in their mind um we should keep talking about let's there are more questions um and there's a, actually an audience question that i'd love to get to actually from oh snap nicole tong what's up uh, this is your audience question. Um, they're a teacher administrator from Northern Virginia Community College. 
in Fairfax, Virginia. What's up, Nicole? Um, Nicole's question was, what's a principle you use for determining line and stanza breaks? For example, in this poem, I'm interested in stanzas that are couplets alongside so many tercets, which I believe are three line stanzas. Um, and I, I just have a lot of questions about the form as well. And I think maybe that also goes back to what you were saying about finding finding the sound of the poem before you're like actually making sense of it. So I'd love to hear about like how this came about. Yeah, well, you just say this in general, maybe this isn't related to this poem exactly, but I'll say this in general. Um, whenever I'm writing, I'm thinking about line more than I'm thinking about line break. And maybe in revision, I think a little bit more about line break, but when I'm writing, I want to make, it's my intent, uh, even in the earliest stages, to make a line that sings out as if it is a poem in and of itself. Mm. So what I really, I have this belief that if I have a conglomeration of good lines, then I must have a good poem. But how do I know if a, if a line is quote unquote good? Well, the meaning that I get from the line in and of itself by itself does something for me. It somehow thrills me, I'm attracted to it, uh, or it's musical. Um, sometimes I realize I'm working in form. This is a free verse poem, mostly, obviously, but sometimes, I, although there's a lot of rhyme in the poem, um, sometimes I realize when I'm working in form because of how the lines send me toward form. You know, like if I'm writing and I end up with A, B, A, B, I start thinking, oh, I might have a sonnet on my hands. Let's see if I can do C, D, C, D. Do you follow what I mean? Um, or if I notice that I'm pushing toward a word over and over again, I think, oh, maybe this should be a sestina because, or, 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 or maybe this should be a hustle uh, because these words keep coming up. Should I reorganize? Uh, in the case of this poem, I think I was writing pretty much line by line and realized that, um, that something was happening at the tercet and couplet le level. Like it's sort of, um, there are two things that sort of naturally happen. One is line length. And if I, if I write a line that is a certain length, I trust that as the line length for that poem. Now that might not, that doesn't always work out, but that is how I make a draft happen. I'm like, okay, that's my first line. Therefore, all the lines of this poem must be around that length because mm -hmm. that's the poem called to me. Now, obviously, if you look at my poems over, and even this poem, right? All the lines are not the same length. So it changes as I'm going on, but that is how a line, or I would like to say a number of beats, is decided on early on in the process. And then, you know, that might change over time. Then the um, in this poem, I sort of noticed that I was taking breaths at tercets and couplets. And I thought it would make sense to take the longer breaths or longer, um, for me, longer moments of thought, right? Ultimately, what am I going to say next? <laughs> Poem's not done yet. Keep pushing, Jericho. And if I notice that that's happening over a series of tercets and couplets, then what I want to do is I want to push such that I'm alternating those every time. Now, in this poem, and I, maybe I shouldn't say this because this gets into the kind of thing that I think is really dangerous, and I don't think poets need this kind of reason to have something. But because I was talking about God and because I was talking about relationships, Adam and Eve, Frankenstein and his monster, Jericho Brown and Don't Nobody Want Me, like because I was doing that in these po in this poem, I wanted the tercet, obviously, for the Trinity as it points to God. Whenever I see ter tercets, I think of that. And I wanted couplets to think about couples. And I didn't want to decide. I thought I could have both. Mm. No, that's great. Um, um, go ahead, Milka, yeah. I was, you know, I was just really thinking about how you were describing your process earlier on when, like, there's you who's writing the poem, but then there's kind of another person in you that's kind of observing you as you write. And so I think I kind of felt that um, as a reader when I was um, going through the poem, because all I kept hearing was this idea of wrestling with ownership and accountability. So like, uh, it seems like like you call Frankenstein and um, uh, God and yourself as control freaks, um, almost like controlling everything but the mistakes that they make, you know? And like, I'm curious to know, like, what does it mean to the narrator, um, ownership and accountability? 
Yeah, I mean, I think part of um, part of what the speaker comes to by the end of the poem is that it's out of his hands. Um, and it's just as out of his hands as it was as in the beginning of the poem when he was complaining. So there are two, <laughs> there are two ways, uh, there are two ways to deal with things that are out of your hands. And one is to freak out. And the other is to be comfortable with the fact that this is out of my hands. And I think part of what the poem is doing is moving from a trajectory of having freaked out to understanding of this is the way life is. I think um, before, cause I know Milka has a ton of more questions. I have a ton of more questions and the audience has a ton of more questions, but we're gonna give Jericho a second to breathe, um, maybe get more water and we're gonna do a little commercial break thing that we we don't have any editing so it's not going to be fancy but we you know we, we're going to talk about a few things firstly um we have jericho brown here so go buy jericho brown merch he already we already talked he has three books out please the new testament and the tradition which again won the pulitzer prize pulitzer prize for poetry that's a mouthful now that i think about it but awesome um so go purchase it we're going to put his links um, his uh, website and his social media handles in the chat. Go follow, subscribe. I don't think that's a, I don't know. Uh, go do those things and buy the books because um, we love that. Also, um, this is put on by LMS Voice. Um, LMS Chat is a part of LMS Voice. If you are a person who is either a teacher, a student, or you just love doing workshops, like, you know, you want to have like a workshop night with your best friends. Doesn't that sound fun? Go to lmsvoice.com and um, you can sign up. Um, it's for free, only three dollars. And you can um, find uh, workshops for artists like Jericho Brown, uh, artists we've had in the past, like Ross Gay, um, Sarah Kay, Jose Olivares, and a bunch of other artists that we've had. I saw somebody in the chat also ask, like, is, like, their connection broke up? So is this going to be somewhere? Yes, um, eventually. But the best way to find out about that is to be on LMS Voice. We will be putting all of our year's chats um, up very soon. So go to LMS Voice, do that. Um, also, as a last cool new thing, we have a sponsor. I don't know if you've been following us. That's very exciting for us. Um, so... Barony Hoyts, um, shout out them. They are going to be our sponsor. They are an engineering firm. They're great. First off, we love them. Second off, we love them. Thank you. Milka, did I say everything? I think I killed it. I think you killed it. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You always do the best for our commercial breaks. Um, so as we transition back to um, one of my favorite sections of the night, uh, we're going to do some culture questions and ask Jericho um, a little bit more zoomed out and not so um, not so poem specific, but more of kind of like him as a whole person. And so I think to start us off, I'd like to kind of ask you, you know, when did you realize that um, when did you realize the impact that poetry had on your personal life? Oh, um... Well, I don't think I really understood it until I was in college. I, I always liked poems. I mean, I was a poetry reader, a pretty big poetry reader, actually, even when I was a little kid. Like I was reading, when I was in the fourth and fifth grade, I was reading Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton, you know what I mean? And Walt Whitman and, um, and, and Emily Dickinson and obviously Langston Hughes and Gwendolyn Brooks and Rita Dove. And uh, anybody the librarians would hand to me, I would read them and not understand a word and I didn't care. I just liked what was happening. I liked, there was something about the poem that seemed like a good time. Um, but then I didn't think of it as, as you say, sort of, uh, I didn't think of its importance until I was in college. And then it became very clear to me that poems were saving my life. I had this idea that I would, um, I had this idea that I would kill myself. And I remember um, thinking, I remember finding the poems of S.X. Hemphill and um, Rudolf Byrd, um, a scholar, 
was no longer with us. He was so important. I was on this fellowship at Emory, actually, where I work. He showed me these poems, and I was like, oh. And I was thinking, I mean, he didn't know that. He wasn't thinking that I had been thinking about killing myself. And I was like, I'm not going to kill myself until after I read the rest of these poems. Like, because the poems were that good. I was like, oh, let me figure out where all these poems are. You know, and it, there was a point at which I was reading unpublished poems by um, by Essex Hemphill in... Um, in Ethelbert Miller's office at Har at Howard University, because I was just on this quest to find every Ethel every Essex Hemphill poem, and then after, but while that was happening, I was discovering these other poets, right? So I would I would quite literally, it's so weird. Like in retrospect, it seems crazy. I would say, oh, I don't I don't want to kill myself. I got to finish reading Walcott first, and then I, you know, so I was literally putting um, somehow putting my death off as if. And then after a while, it just got silly. It was like, oh, I'd rather just read poems than kill myself. You know, I sort of had to realize that. Um, but at the time, that is really what was happening. Like I was, I was holding something, holding some harm, some self harm off for myself by by immersing myself in poetry. And I knew the poems were doing that. I knew that somehow the poems were what. They were all I had to look forward. The poems were all I had to look forward to. I remember reading Toy Derricotte for the first time and thinking, oh, this is cool. I could be alive a little longer if I can find some more books by Toy. So that's sort of what it was like. I think it's really interesting because I feel like it's so easy to fall into these like, these uh, dark spirals or dark holes and, um, I feel like the opposite kind of happened to you where you almost were just skipping over them like wherever you found poems and so I just think it's super cool how how much it subtly and overtly kind of distracted you from like things like so dark and so um I don't know yeah no um, um that's very very cool so thank you for sharing that we're so glad you found poems <laughs> yeah thank you too thank you yeah, I really didn't have anything I wanted to do for a very long time other than read and write poem. Like I didn't, I didn't understand what anything else, how to gain satisfaction in any other area. And I think reading and writing the poems helped remind me where I could, where I could gain that satisfaction in other areas. I mean, I learned a lot from poetry. I learned history. I learned science. You know, you just learn um, reading poems. If I could. <laughs> Um, cause I know, like, I, I think it's interesting you're talking about, like, the impact poetry had on you in college, and now we know that you are, I, running, if you're, if you go to Emory, uh, shout out y'all, uh, this is a person that's on your campus, but, um, as, like, a teacher and as a professor, somebody who has, like, students now, who may be, like, you know, not looking for poetry in that way, but maybe, you know, looking for something. In that way um i i'm curious about you know what um what you feel like poetry means to them or what, what it means to be able to give them um what you know helped you in that same way ask that question again yeah uh i'm curious about we were just talking about the impact poetry had on you and now i'm curious about like how, giving it to students and being able to you know teach them and offer them, you know, this thing that mattered that much to you? Well, I mean, you know, I think, I think, um, actually, I, you know, people keep telling me I'm some sort of, I don't know, benevolent teacher or something. I just really think <laughs> I'm more selfish than that. I really do. You know, I kind of like, uh, I want to talk about poems all the time. Mm -hmm. and nobody actually wants that. Do you, <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Like, other than my poet friends, and I'm not, you know, you're not with your poet friends all the time, you know? <laughs> and so other than that, like, I still want to talk about poetry and it kind of gets on people's nerves, but it can't get on my students' nerves because that's a business. <laughs> so they're just really doing oh something. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, I'm serious. Like, I, I feel like I get to look at things over and over again that I, that I love and change my mind about them with my students. And I get them, you know, I have, I look at new poems that I haven't, you know, I'm always bringing new poems into class that are new for me. Um, but even when I'm looking at poems that I've looked at a thousand times or 700,000 times, when I bring those poems to class, it never fails. Every 
every semester a student says something I would not have expected that I never saw in the poem that is indeed there. And I learn from my students much better. So I'm sort of like, like I sort of make my students do whatever they do just because it gives me a thrill. You know, I feel like I'm, I don't know, I, I, I yeah, it's pretty selfish actually, you know? I, I'm curious to talk to one of your students now to see if like, yeah, he's just kind of using us. It's just like every class, it's like. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I think they're pretty aware. They're like, <laughs> they kind of look at me and roll their eyes sometimes. So I, I think they're aware. Uh, as, a, as an educator, you know, have you seen yourself like, a, do you feel like you've been able to almost expand your definition of what being a poet has been like? Like, you know, like you take on roles such as being like the director of the creative writing program um, or just being in the classroom, like what has it, have you, have you expanded yourself more or have you, are you more of a like mastered poet because of it or are they very different like roles? Well, yeah, of course, I think I'm better. I think the more I interact and the more I experience, yeah, that makes me a better poet. I don't think I'm necessarily special for poets though. I mean, every poet I know is doing something other than writing poetry in order, like y'all are doing this, for instance. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know a poet who isn't like um, running a magazine or teaching or somehow mentoring or, you know, uh, reviewing books. You know, we're always poets more than I think any other artists are invested uh, not in our art just because we do it, but because we send it out, right? We are, and we are not just poets, we become, because we're poets, we become ambassadors for poetry. And so part of what we do is we help, um, we help to keep people in love with the thing and we introduce that love to new people. Do you know what I'm saying? So, uh, so I, don't, I don't think I'm very different in that regard. I mean, every poet in the world is mentoring somebody in some way or getting mentored by somebody in some way. So I don't, I don't, I mean, even if I didn't have, I mean, when I didn't have students, I was telling people, you gotta read this book. And that's ultimately what I do as a teacher, tell people, you gotta read this book. And then you gotta tell me what you think about it. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh to add on, or not to add on, um, to feature some of our audience questions, you know, um, I think they want to know, you know, uh, to what, this is from Tamara Nicole from Claremont High School, you know, to what extent have your experiences as a poet impacted your academic, academic achievements and to what extent have your academic achievements impacted your poetry? What are academic achievements? Um, I'll, I'm just going to assume what they mean. I'm, I'm thinking like awards you've won or like what, what it's taken for you to get like the, the research you've contributed to the, um, uh, I'm, I'm really just. Yeah, you know, I think, um, I think all of those things are a part of it. Um, even poets who do not teach do what we think of as academic work. I mean, Lee Young Lee is not a person who teaches poetry. Um, and yet he, he does, you know, memoir and does, uh, uh, prose. Um, so I don't, you know, and I, and, you know, and Lee Young Lee could have, I mean, Lee Young Lee has won awards for his poetry. So I always think that's just a part of it. And I really love winning awards. It's my favorite. It's one of my favorite things. Uh, I know I'm not supposed to say that, but it's tr true. Like, every time. <laughs> Even when I'm not up for an award, like when I find out somebody else won an award, I'm usually just happy for them because I'm like, wow, I just found out about another award. This is great for you. I hope I get it next time. Do you know what I'm saying? So I'm all pro awards as long as they're going to Jericho Brown. Uh, <laughs> um, I, don't, um, I don't think it's hard to be a poet and, um, and sort of participate in in that in a codified way. And that's all the university provides me is some sort of um, structure around which to get my poems done. And there might be some other structure that I could have brought to it had I not have had the university, but that's what I use. Uh, and I pretty much 
organize my life around my students. I mean, definitely um, for most of the year, my life is organized around my students' needs. So. I think to follow up, you know, um, as you've kind of navigated this life of educator and poet, you know, what, what have you been most proud of as you've um, learned how to master the art of words? I don't know. I mean, sometimes when I'm working, you know, there are certain moments in my last book that I just really felt like uh, I had finally gotten this thing. I mean, I don't, I'm not looking at it now. Maybe I wouldn't feel that way. Right. And it is true when you finish a book, you sort of look back on it and you're, you know, you're, um, what they say at my church is your, um, your ceiling becomes your floor. You know, you work really, I mean, that, and that is life. And if you can realize that is life, you will get through so many moments where you're concerned about your own ability to show gratitude. Um, so, you know, I've worked, I worked toward making my first book. I worked toward making my second book. I worked toward making my third book. And every time I write a book, I feel like I'm better at writing poetry. And then right after that, I look back at the book and I'm like, what is this mess? Like, why, why did I do this? Do you know what I'm saying? So, but I'm proud, but I'm, you know, that moment that I was reading to y'all when that, when that poem turns into a poem about God and Adam and Eve, I'm proud of that. Like, and that's generally what I'm, what I'm most proud of, those moments where when I'm working, I see myself doing something that I could not do before. Because that means that whatever I've been studying on my way to work is paying off. So, and that makes me, that really makes me happy. It's beautiful. Um, I think it might be time. Um, thank you. A part of me is very emotional for some reason, but um, I think it's time for the chop it up section, um, which is, as we kind of let Jericho know, this is when we ask him very hard questions. And these questions are meant to make him, no, um, very silly questions that are actually very difficult. Uh, Milka, did you want to start or is it like on me? Uh, I can I can start as you <laughs> gather yourself. So since it is still spooky season and we're coming to the end of October, um, we want to know what's your dream Halloween costume? What do I what? what what's your dream Halloween costume? Oh, probably not very many clothes. Something where I could, I mean, my dream would be to have the body necessary where I could, like, hardly have on any clothes and they <laughs> want to arrest me because I look so good. <laughs> but I mean, that's a dream. I would never wear that now. But like, if I could get it together, baby, yeah. <laughs> you could tell I've never gotten it together because you had <laughs> when any Halloween costume, because I'm not wearing a dream costume, which is, you know, I don't know, slutty devil, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> you got to do at least one slutty devil before you get out of here. Um, this is why you got to follow Jericho Brown, so you can keep up to date if he's finally done his slutty devil. Um, uh, this is a question we read in some interviews that you are a fan of the Golden Girls. So we were curious... Which of the Golden Girls was your favorite, if you have a favorite? Uh, I don't know if I have a favorite. You know, um, I think something about the way that Blanche is Southern and is really attractive to me, you know, and she's like, you trash. You know what I mean? It's so funny because it reminds me of real people I grew up with you know, <laughs> growing up or, uh, you know, well, that wouldn't be Southern. I'd never do that. So um, I, she might be my favorite. I really love, um, but I feel like I'm more like Rose. So I always feel like I should like Rose the best because whenever I'm in a group and I'm looking around to see who's Dorothy, who's Rose, who's Blanche, who's Sophia, right. generally Rose. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I feel like that's a better question. Like who of the Golden Girls yeah. are Um so now we know your rose. Um, shout out all the Blanche fans. I see some Blanche fans in the chat. Um, so um, I, as I think about your slutty double costume, um, 
I can't help but you know think of the question, what product or company would you be a cover model for? Oh, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, I would have to think about it. There's this uh, skin product called... Words have left my head. <laughs> Wait, this is very important. What is it? Glytone. And um, it was very helpful to me. I had some stuff going on with my skin that just, oh my God, it was the worst. And I found this Glytone stuff and it really helped out a lot. And I feel a lot better now. And I thank God for it. So maybe, I don't know, Glytone, Tretinoin, something like that. I, I feel like I could see you in the beauty supply store. Like you give me, like it, it could be there. Also, I store where there's poster faces on. The <laughs> <laughs> Not inside, just on the window before you even walk in. Like you be looking this way, and then there be like another guy holding you, and it'd be like. <laughs> <laughs> um. Also, I want to shout out the one of the reasons we had that question is you did the the posters in New York um on the new york transit um so it's like one step closer uh i think we have we have one more or maybe two more one more okay um we have two more because i know what the last one's gonna be kind of i got you bet um what hymn or church song could you dance to anywhere or just get up anywhere anytime you hear it it's like revival right now um well there's two come to mind the first uh in terms of dance or just like feeling it in getting excited sort of automatically there's a version of um it shall be done uh by Derek coley that i love what so thing what things soever you ask when you pray believe it and it shall be done unto you abide in me and my word in you receive it and it shall be done unto you just keep the faith have patience, just wait, and I'll swiftly bring it to pass. It shall be done, it shall be done, it shall be done unto you. I love that song. Um, Daryl Coley uh, is great, I love him. Um, and I miss him every day. And I, uh, and but lately I've been listening to a song that's not really a, you wouldn't really shout, you would shout, but maybe after or during the song, cause it's much slower, there's a version of, um, Beams of Heaven by Olita Adams that uh, every time I hear it, I just cry. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And I got a chance to um, play it for my friend, uh, a poet, uh, J.W. Lofton. And he was like, okay, I'm worn out now. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been listening to that a lot lately. Thank you. And uh, our, I think our final Chop It Up question, we, we asked the last time, I think oh, it was a question, <laughs> and I think it was a hit. I think our audience members enjoyed it, uh, and best believe I'm trying to brand it as part of this section of uh, LMS chat. So since it's chop it up, what do you put in the salad? What do I what? What do you put in the salad? In the in the salad. Sorry, I, I speak softly. Well, that's interesting. I mean, well, okay, so. I would have to see what my lettuce choices are. I mean, <laughs> a kale or a romaine, not a spinach, um, and not an iceberg. Um, chicken. Um, I like carrots, shredded carrots. I like. Uh, I like. Uh, what else do I like in a salad? I don't know. It's got to have some tang, so maybe a little olive and or pickle or something, but just a little. Um, what else would go in my salad? I don't know. I'm not a salad maker, I guess. Um, what dressing are you using? Well, so, you know, if I wanted to live right, I'd be using some sort of a light dressing, right? Like a balsamic, something that you can see through. But really, that's not what I want. What I want is like a French a thousand island or yeah. <laughs> probably, I mean, I hadn't had either one of those in so long. You just put it on my mind. I'm supposed to be on a fast, but maybe I'm not. All of a sudden, <laughs> um, a French at Thousand Island, or you know, sometimes depending on what else go is going on, honey mustard is good on a salad too. That's that's a throwback. That classic. 
Yeah. I mean, Thousand Island is probably my favorite. I think I like it better than French. Oh. Um. I think you have convinced me to keep this question in our list for next time. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I think it's a great question. Um, give it up one more time virtually for our guest, Jericho Brown. Um, he is here. He's owned Benadryl. And we've had such an amazing time um, talking to you. We're so honored and humbled that you'd be here with us. Um, thank you again. Um, real quick, we're going to bring up um, another co-conspirator of ours, Brian, to let us know who we're interviewing next week. So, uh, Brian, uh, scurry up here. Uh, tell us, uh, who are we interviewing next week? Uh, so, next month, well, first of all, thank you, Jericho, for being here. Um, we appreciate your presence and your your time. Um, good job, Kenny and Melka, and thank you to all my Hayfield, Hayfield people who made it out. Anyhow, next month's guest is going to be uh elizabeth acevedo so that will be um at some point mid uh november we will send out the date so please make sure you stay tuned great you all so, it's been a pleasure so happy to have had jericho here um with us so happy to be co-hosting with kenny and brian thank you yeah thank you thank you Anytime. Okay. Uh, good night, everyone. <laughs> it's nine. We don't want to keep you any longer. Um, it was a pleasure. I'll see y'all later. We should have an ending song. You know, this I, is what we need right now. Like a so long farewell. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs>